Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the inner personality with the best hair. And, uh, yeah, they made another Doom movie. This time, straight to video. I guess after your first theatrical attempt in 2005 went down about as well as a Bloody Mary made with actual blood, or hell, that Doom-branded bone vodka they're making if you want to be topical, yeah, the idea of making a film series out of the Doom franchise wasn't looking that likely after that. So 14 years later, on a much tighter budget, we get a new Doom movie straight to video, but not a sequel, more of a, a reboot. But I'm sure it's going to be just as terrifying. And that means we have to go over how the UAC got involved with demons yet again. This time, scientists on Mars moon Phobos have had a fantastic breakthrough! Portal technology! However, as it turns out, the teleporter that links Earth and Phobos does so by building a bridge through hell! Thus, demons! Better get your guns! So it's less of a reboot of Doom based on the Doom mythos and more of a reboot of Doom based on Doom 3. Again. But nevertheless, let's take a look at Doom Annihilation and see if it really does manage to annihilate Doom. We open up in space, in Martian orbit specifically, the Martian moon Phobos and the UAC research facility on it. We establish there are colored key cards just like the game, wielded by our big science guy, Dr. Betruger, played by Dominique Mafham. Are you nervous? Oh, it's perfectly natural to me. Who doesn't look or sound anything like Dr. Petruger from Doom 3. Just stay out of my way. Amazing things will happen here soon. You just wait. Then again, it is kinda hard to make him seem maybe not evil if he did. In this version of events, he's the kind and gentle sounding lead of this research project into teleportation technology. Dr. Barnes, played by Nathan Cooper, is going to be the first person to step through the portal in UAC's facility in Nevada and arrive on Phobos in the blink of an eye. Of course, everyone celebrates the success of this experiment before bothering to look at the state of the guy. Unknown thermal impact. <laughs> he arrived in one piece, but horrifyingly transformed into a demonic beast! Or social repose, I'm not quite sure. That's the hint you're watching a Doom movie, as now we have to get to the real important plot points. First of all, a dream about our protagonist's mother, Olivia, played by Kate Nichols, dying of cancer. This had evidently during suspended animation, as she awakens from her hypersleep. Welcome back, Lieutenant Dark. My name is Daisy, and I'm here to assist you in any way possible. Daisy, played by Gina Phillips, is one of several references to the little bunny rabbit in Doom 1 and 2, while Lieutenant Dark is possibly the worst character name they could have chose. Played by Amy Manson, her full name is Joan Dark, supposedly as in Joan of Arc, but it's uncomfortably close to Joanna Dark, the protagonist from the Perfect Dark series of video games. Joan Dark, on the other hand, is not a character from Doom. She's made specifically for this movie. Malfunction. Malfunction. You gotta be kidding. Much like hypersleep, space truckery, and pretty much all the inspiration from Alien clearly on display that is not from Doom. Uh, I'm not saying you can't have a female Doom guy and make it work, but this is pretty similar to if they made a Horizon Zero Dawn movie starring a guy named Doug Nukem. Based on Doug Bradley. Moving on. It's time. Where the fuck did you go? Tark, I'm telling you, that's why he said it. Whoa, 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 hold on, how in the hell is he playing a VR game that is obviously using hand tracking when he's playing with a touchscreen phone? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that just bothers me. This is our big group of space marines, gathered around the Nostromo dining table, of course. We've got tons of effectively unimportant faces that have to get their character traits out as quickly as possible, such as Headset Man, Private Winslow, played by Clayton Adams, Lee, the lady with the lost but lucky panties, played by Gemma Moore, Carly Corbin, hair dye enthusiast, played by Nina Bergman, Aqua, the discount Blaine, played by Chidi Ayufo, Rance, the super beard, played by Amir Chada Patel, and uh, that's enough for now because Miss Dark just walked in and it turns out everyone in school thinks she has cooties, so they all leave the lunch table. Everyone that is except for Joan's ex, Dr. Bennett Stone, played by Luke Allen Gale. Seems like a good group. They can be. You look good, John. Thanks. Not entirely sure why they broke up, but I'm pretty sure it has a little bit to do with the fact that he is effectively making this awkward situation even more awkward than it has to be. 
Dark's team is heading to Phobos to work as security. Stone is excited being a scientist, while Dark knows for a marine it's a shit assignment. Ah oh, well, this science must go on as Betruger has a minor argument with Dr. Khan, played by Hari Dillon. Khan says the last guy they sent through the portal didn't come out quite right on the other end, so they should cut back on the teleporting for now. Betruger, on the other hand, insists that humanity needs this technological breakthrough, and no minor glitch in Reconstruction is going to stop him from continuing the experiments! I could not, in good conscience, select another to go through the gates. You won't have to. I'll go myself. <laughs> because nothing ever goes wrong when the mad scientist begins doing the experiment on himself, right? <laughs> Isn't that like 60% of all supervillain origin stories? Dark's superior is Captain Hector Savage, played by James Webber Brown. Also, just a side note, I find it kind of hilarious the guy looks damn near like the Doom Guy face from Doom 1 and 2, but really is just a side character. He details their job. SECURITY! Sit on this moon and look tough, because the UAC research is worth something on the black market, which also has access to spaceships in this century, I suppose. Why did we all get sent here? Because only one of us had fucked up. But, what, we all get fucked? I'm right here. If you're gonna talk about me, have the balls to address me directly. You fucked up. Which explains the animosity her crew has for her. Some time ago, Dark fucked something up, and now everyone has to suffer the terrible consequence of SECURITY DUTY! Oh, how dreadful! While they seethe and prepare for the terrifyingly boring assignment, the Trigger is getting prepped for the portal run, with the help of Veronica, played by Katrina Nair. With his physical condition A-OK, -okay, it's time to dip your toe into the metaphysical. Well, that's what happens when you try and find out if your old-ass computer can really handle ultra settings. So Betruger has vanished, the power is out, and everyone is injured! Looking to help, Veronica heads to the health vendor. However... She is suddenly attacked by the Foley Department! And it's cheaper than CGI, and oftentimes actually looks better. This little crisis means that when the Marines reach the base, nobody is answering their calls! Eventually, they get an emergency message about an urgent developing situation, but... Eh, just because the ship's full of badasses with guns doesn't mean they need to know any more than that. The fact that the systems won't let them in means they're kinda stuck there, though. However, Stone knows about a secret emergency entrance just a bit down into the left. When I found out I was being transferred, I read everything there was to know about the base. Including where the emergency entrance is in case you ever got locked out on the surface? That's just the movie's way of saying, yeah, we know, it's convoluted as hell and incredibly convenient, but just roll with it, okay? With the way inside established, now all that's left to do is load up, get ready, and dock this some bitch. Whoa, hey. Except for the fact that the base they're interfacing with does have this problem with the power that is obviously affecting the ship, but... I mean, they just go and ignore it anyway, so who really cares? What? What the fuck, Daisy? All the system's normal. <sighs> Working as intended! Be honest, you saw this coming as soon as Doom started getting published by Bethesda. So the team doesn't let that slow him down, and heads down to the little connecting tube into the UAC research facility. However, it doesn't take long before Stone discovers something concerning. Reserve power's at 2%. That's bad? That's an understatement. Shitty luck, it turns out their emergency power system is a cell phone battery. No bother, time to head down those suspiciously square and featureless hallways. Is this a Doom movie or Wolfenstein 3D? Okay, let's move out. Captain, hold up. What is it? The reserve powers are just over 2%. That gives us about 90 minutes. It's cool, just enough time to squeeze in a feature-length movie. Actually, they aren't moving out. Why concern ourselves with little things like pacing, when the action can just stop dead in this hallway, so Stone can talk about how fucked they are? Seems the base is powered by a nuclear reactor. And somehow these space marines are accustomed to hypersleep and moon bases just fine, think nuclear energy is just ridiculously unsafe. And if that last 2% of power goes, the safeguards for the reactor go, thus a team is quickly assembled to try and get to the reactor and get it back online, while the rest of them are heading for the servers. Thought this was a high-tech base. Even high-tech needs basic plumbing. And that involves chainsaws... how? Well, at least in Doom 3, they actually did manage to explain the ridiculousness of chainsaws in space. Shipping error. 
It's not hard. Delving deeper into the depths, in due course they discover a decapitated dead dude! Sergeant William Blaskovich. Ah, so this is the Wolfenstein 3D movie. They also left a little note written in Sumerian. And blood, but the point is that this is the future and it can be translated. Have come to reclaim what is ours. Through wrath will come justice. Through pain to divinity. No escape this time. Ugh, it's not the forces of hell, but they're being attacked by amateur performance artists. Their slow march down dark corridors continues, and even with the occasional corpse and threat, things still wind up rougher than they imagine. One problem is Daisy keeps fucking up their map, meaning they can't rely on Google to navigate their asses to their destinations. Also, now's about the time that strange figures can be seen moving just barely into frame and then out of it again before they can react. Whatever could they be? <laughs> Our space marines, everybody! I mean, there's so damn many of them, I expected them to die pretty quickly, but to the first zombie guy? Really? Noob. At least one of them is competent enough to actually shoot the damn zombies, and then Captain Savage sees something else hiding around the corner. On my go. Three, two, one. Dosser! Dosser! To fucking hell, lady, you can say don't shoot while still hiding around the corner, instead of just rushing out in front of the guys with their guns trained on you like that moron innocence and lethal enforcers. This idiot is Dr. Peterson, played by Lorena Kambarova. She's here with two other survivors, Veronica and the chaplain, Glover, played by Louis Mandalore. Either way, we have survivors! And casualties, as Winslow discovers a zombie munching on Harry, played by Gavin Brocker. Emphasis on past tense. Fortunately, he survives and doesn't shoot the protagonist in the state of shock. Thus, they establish radio communication with the other squad and relay that information that they have a man down. Joan then gets a closer look at the creature to tell them exactly what they're dealing with. Dr. John Carmack. Get it? Like one of the head creators of Doom, John Carmack! He's now Dr. Carmack. They also had a reference similar to this in the original Doom movie, where they had the character of Dr. Carmack. You know, if you're going to keep referencing the creators of Doom in the movies, could you at least maybe do it like the games did? Can we have John Romero's head on a stick somewhere? The fact that people who used to work here are now running around with blue skin and trying to eat folks is a bit confusing, so Dr. Peterson steps in to explain it. We have a... situation. <laughs> ah, finally, someone who understands the importance of Show Don't Tell. Thus an action scene breaks out, and the body count rises. You might be thinking to yourself, hey, these are just the basic-ass former human zombie men that don't even have guns. No big deal. Well, you're thinking about it from the perspective of someone who has played the games and know that Hell has legions of various demons with different abilities to fight the heroes with. In the movie, though, we get, like, two, maybe three kinds of enemies. So the zombie men are the running zombies, like we see on no Doom game ever, and they are somehow more than capable of killing battle-hardened space marines in their first encounter. Seriously, how the hell hard is it to kill a dozen or so zombies with a chain gun, even on Ultra Nightmare difficulty? While most of them seem to be marine in name only, Joan at least knows how to use a motherfucking chainsaw! <laughs> Okay, not gonna lie, this movie might be worth it for that scene alone. Hell, I might give it a whole other star if she can throw a couple of them into a wood chipper. Unfortunately, after this glorious evisceration, she just drops the chainsaw and we can forget it ever existed for the rest of the running time. She doesn't need it anyway, it's the rest of these guys who can't seem to figure out which end of the gun does the shooty thing. Next on the chopping block is Lee, who is pooped to death! As the strategy of stand around and wait to be killed isn't doing the best, it's decided they should take their survivors, or the remaining survivors, and fall back. Which still doesn't go nearly as smoothly as it should, as Captain Savage is torn apart by the zombie hordes. Okay, Joan decides to see if she can get blood from a stone and convince him to tell her just what the hell is going on on this base. They found evidence of alien life. Oh, oh, oh. I fucking knew it! Of course! Doom, the game where you fight the aliens. From hell? Still counts. This requires some explanation, and who better to explain than Dr. Petruger, the UAC Phobos Lab's reigning hide-and-seek champion. The information about where the teleportation technology came from will finally be revealed. 
later. First, we have to stop off in the ship to remind us that the pilot is still in this movie, arguing with Daisy, but as it turns out, that wasn't Daisy at all. We're in the midst of an experiment when... Whoa, 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 wait, wait, go back. What the hell was that? Was that an imp? It's not an imp like in Doom, or Doom 3, or 4. It looks more like the Giver and a Cenobite had a baby. Yeah, who cares about questionable design choices when you have the questionable plot to summarize? Dr. Petruger explains, you know what? Overpopulation and limited resources are a bitch, so in order for humanity to survive, we need to find another planet to colonize. And while we found several possible candidates, getting to them hasn't been feasible. Even though you already showed off, you have cryosleep technology. I mean, you call it crypto-sleep because we totally aren't ripping off aliens, but it's cryosleep. But, yeah, that is useful for traveling in space because your destination is really far away. It could take years or maybe decades to get to it, and it doesn't really matter if you're frozen during the time. However, you used it to get to Mars, which takes, like, a couple of months with today's technology. But cryosleep isn't good enough for interplanetary colonists. Nope, we need teleportation technology. Fortunately, they just so happen to discover an ancient teleporter on Phobos and Earth. How convenient! While these are the only ones we found, our theory is, is that there, there are others all across the universe. Allowing us to bring colonists to new frontiers full of life! Like Phobos, a desolate wasteland of a moon in a decaying orbit with Mars which is going to make both places not really spots you'd want to build long-term cities on, but... Go... Progress! So, long story short, they found out how to turn the teleporters on, tried them out, and then... Uh, Betruger doesn't remember. But shit happened! And to make it clear, they were demons. Demons? Made of fire. One of them took me. They tried to possess me, tried to turn me into one of those. Oh, Lost Souls are in this movie! I mean... The plot, at least. We never actually see one. So yeah, Facility is besieged by monsters from hell, but Petruger is taking this like John Hammond, saying it's a minor setback, but you know what? The show must go on. Joan doesn't agree, though, and says what they need to do is get the hell out of there and leave the base to blow up with the failing reactor. Eventually, Joan gets them all to retreat back to the ship, but the fact that the captain is well and truly dead, uh, he's not opening the door. No bother, they can force their way back in just the same. Splitting up right away, everyone scurries off into their preferred corner of the ship to get ready for travel, get a bite to eat, and set themselves up to be murdered by horrifying demons, of course. There you go. Because nothing says demons from hell quite like them just staying all silent in the corner, hiding just out of frame for that stealth kill. And the body count rises, the demons attack, and Rance is disemboweled in short order. Joan is doing fine, of course, but that doesn't mean she's in the clear. What are you doing? Jesus, would you stop that? Jump around the corner with your hands waving in front of guns one more time, and I wouldn't be surprised if they just shoot you even though they know it's you. Especially considering Joan thinks the best thing to do with you is hand you a gun to wave around while you do whatever it is you do. On with the action scene, the demons have more tricks up their sleeves. Like actually throwing fireballs. Not really like the imps in the Doom games and more like Liu Kang, but you know, at this point I'll take what I can get. A bit of a surprise is the demon's newfound soul-sucking ability. Not sure where the hell this came from, but it doesn't matter anyway as a chaplain walks in, shoots the demon, saves Joan's soul, and is promptly killed. Another one bites the dust, I guess. Well, now the ship is well and truly grounded, and they're surrounded by demons. Twenty-some-odd minutes left until the moon blows up. Uh, let's gather around the dinner table discussing what course of action to do next. You know, like an alien. Mars knows we're here. When we don't report back, they'll send a rescue party. We'll secure the ship. Anything tries to get in, we take out. But despite knowing perfectly well about the impending boom boom since Act 1, now everyone just is sitting there like, yeah, you know, we can just wait for the rescue party. I mean, that was the plan they had in Aliens, wasn't it? But remember the problem with that plan in Aliens? How the atmospheric generator was damaged and going to blow up in mere hours? Well, that's kind of the shocking revelation we get when the team just fucking remembers, oh yeah, we have 15 minutes to live. Just sitting around the dinner table chatting up our options when we obviously need to get the reactor turned on is kind of a fucking waste of time, isn't it? But Truger's okay with the idea if it means getting the teleporter back online, which Joan agrees with, 
if only you get him to cooperate for now, as she obviously doesn't want him to turn that back on, just keep them from all blowing up. Conveniently enough, the path to the reactor is much shorter and clearer than it was at any other part of the movie, meaning you can just go and turn it back on in no time. However, about Betruger's blackout... I remember everything. Ah! And you won't be telling a soul. John! Oh, that's gotta be awkward when your colleague is watching you getting murdered and calls out the name of his ex. Surprise, but Truger was evil all along. He's working with the demons to destroy humanity. On that note, Private Corbin is the next name to be crossed off that chalkboard. But not to worry, Jonah's still here to kick all the asses, take all the names, and defeat all the demonic hordes. Sweet shooting. Or most of them, anyway. After that little scuffle, pretty much everybody is fucking dead now. Spare Joan, Stone, and Betruger. Hold on, though. Veronica is still alive just long enough to cough up some blood about how the portal is down in a secret lab on the secret level 4 of the moon base, and they need the yellow key to access it. So, taking the key, the two of them set out to make a beeline for the armory because we forgot to establish this thing was in the movie. That's the BFG 9000. I've only ever read about it, never actually seen one. Of course, no Marine calls it that. What do they call it? The big fucking gun. Of course. It's like the BFG scene from the first Doom movie, except without the setup, the rock, or nearly as cool of a delivery. But now that she's got her hands on the trash can with a trigger, NOTHING CAN STOP THEM! Man, they are really not very good at this. And then again, this BFG ain't exactly that great of a firearm. Sure, she could take a zombie or a demon out in one shot, but come on, she had to shoot each of them with a direct hit? Hardly makes the ammo restriction feel worth it at that point. Oh well, after our obligatory haul of corpses, we finally get the standoff between Joan and Betruger. Seeing she can one-shot imps, which are for some reason still the toughest monster available, he ups the ante by having ZOMBIFIED EX-BOYFRIEND ATTACK! No idea why, but this actually messes her up, instead of just making it even easier to pull the trigger. Eventually, she fights him off, and even SHOOTS Betruger! But it's not like that really did anything. You can't kill what's already dead. No, but you're not doing the concept of movies based on video games any favors. Once on the other side, Joan finds herself... IN HELL. Well, wherever this is, it's got tons of black goo, demons, and not the best relationship with humanity. Seems they've wanted to kill us for a while and have just been having a bit of trouble for the last few thousand years, but thanks to the work of Dr. Betruger, they may in fact wipe all of humanity from the face of the Earth! Yay! Also, just gonna say this, CGI imps here, they look better. They look like something in between the Doom 1, 3, and 4 imps. That's not bad. The big takeaway here, though, is that Joan shoots the hell out of Satan Sauron, and an Oblivion Gate opens up. So leaping through, she finds herself back on Earth, at the Nevada Research Facility. Everyone's more than a little confused. They were expecting Petruger, but they do heed Joan's warnings by sedating her and not shutting down the portal. After all, what's the worst that could happen? Oh, the annihilation of all human life, that's right. Whoops. Oh well, the end. <laughs> and thank fuck for that. So, that was Doom Annihilation. Holy hell! No, I didn't expect much from it going in, and no, it didn't surprise me with how supremely bad it was or anything like that. It did certainly surprise me with how much it seemed to take from Alien and Aliens and not something else, like, oh, I don't know, Doom? But for what it is, a straight-to-video movie based on a video game, it's not nearly as bad as it could have been. Presentation-wise, the movie looks sharp. Not theatrical quality, but a hell of a lot better than your average Asylum flick. They could have taken the easy way out to just keep everything too dark to see, letting us scare ourselves with our imaginations instead of the movie putting in the legwork. And while the sets and monsters are lacking in variety, they do at least look adequate. Acting and writing... Well, I get the feeling everyone knew what kind of project this is. You're making a screenplay for a low-budget movie about a popular video game. Try not to screw up too bad. That's simple. Copy and paste a few plot points from other sci-fi horror flicks, bring out the crew and let them read out their lines, and boom, we've got a film. I feel like the writing is the weaker part here, as the acting holds up pretty well, honestly. It's not the easiest material to work with and give a great performance to, but nobody really phones it in. They just 
give a decent performance. At least for the five minutes of screen time they have before the plot says they suffered a minor prick and thus die. Overall, Doom Annihilation isn't a horrible movie, but it's a pretty damn bad Doom movie, with nods and references to the franchise around every corner, while the central plot thread just about ignores that and pretends it's aliens for a while. Not an ungodly abomination, but it ain't Doom, coming in at two completely insane dinner table chats out of five. Doom Annihilation is to the Doom movie what Mortal Kombat Annihilation was to the Mortal Kombat movie. It's not absolutely unwatchable, but I am not expecting a third one anytime soon. Thank you all for watching, I have Decker Shadow, and remember, check those corners for those sneaky sneaky demons. You fucked up.